Well, good morning if you are in Los Angeles or San Francisco. Good afternoon if you are in Santa Fe or Dallas or Tosca or Tulsa, rather, or St. Louis or New York City. Good evening if you're in St. Gallen, Switzerland. All places where my guest, Tobias Picker, the opera composer, has had premieres of his fantastic works. One of them is actually named Fantastic. Um, welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to music lovers all around the world. And Tobias Picker is someone who I've known of. I've seen five of the seven operas. And by the way, he's written a lot more than opera, but that's going to be the focus today. Uh, he's written vocal music, symphonic music, ballets, and I'm sure other things I'm leaving out that Tobias can tell me. He joins me from his home in New York, not too far from where I live. Um, and although we both grew up in the same island and we're more or less in the same age group, and I've discovered you know, many, many of the same people, to my knowledge, you and I have never met. And so I'm happy to meet you now. It's nice to meet you. Definitely. So um, I think what I would like to do, I'm going to ask you one question first, and then I want to get into your seven operas. Um, what directed you early on to becoming an opera composer and why opera? Well, I am. Um, I, uh, I did have an impulse to write opera very as, as a small child. And I would say that was due to environmental um, causes, um, a few things that that uh, the that um, influenced, I think, my my uh, thinking. One was I had a, my grandfather was a a German Jew who was uh, who was a Wagnerian and he he was such a Wagnerian that considered all other composers to be beneath Wagner and. Uh, whenever I was, we went to visit my grandparents in White Plains. Uh, I would, I would get out of the car, and my grandmother would hug me. My grandfather would say hello and look down at me, and and say, "How is Wagner today?" <laughs> and I, I never knew what to say because I wasn't Wagner, so I didn't know. So. And I also, I he was it was as if he was brainwashing me to to put these ideas in my head. I don't know if he meant to, to do it in, on purpose, but I was only, I mean, even at four and five, I I insisted on dressing myself as a as a, a little kid, and uh, I I had trouble finding socks that matched. So I would I would just go visit and. He'd look down at my feet and say, "Oh, two different socks." Wagner always wore two two different socks. <laughs> Everything he he related back to Wagner. He, he said that he was the greatest composer that ever lived. But I would say, "What about Mozart?" And he would say, "Deedle deedle deep music," and mm. Beethoven he dismissed as minor. But so. There was that. I, I would. I would then ask my. I remember asking my mother, "Is it? Tr is that true? What what Grandpa said that that she's and she said absolutely not. Don't, don't <laughs> listen to him. No, he he only likes Wagner. Um, then I would say there were other influences. Tobias, I'd like to know what your grandmother thought of all this Wagner in the house. Did they have a big enough house for her to get away from it occasionally? Well, I don't. I was never there when he put it on the record player. He had, huh. he had records, um, but I, I think maybe they listened to the radio the broadcast from the Met. So I wasn't there then. But she loved music. They both played the piano, 
And um, yeah, she loved Wagner, but she also loved Chopin and Debussy. And, uh, she she didn't argue with him about it. Um, so yeah, I I know that he went. He, he 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 went. He took her to see Melchior and Blagstad at the Met, and uh, but yeah, I, I I would say the, there there are a few influences I guess that that put opera in my brain as a I don't think I was born with opera in my brain, but maybe I mean he the the environment was very different in America in in those days in the late 50s and early 60s it was a more um we had well we had no cable television we had as you know we had three networks and a couple of local new york stations and uh but network television played classical music every saturday there was the leonard bernstein young people's concerts on cbs um that every every Christmas there was a mall in the night visitors on CBS and then they sold it to NBC I think and but it, I looked forward every every year to seeing this this opera by this modern opera by Menotti on TV and mm -hmm. it you know it spoke to me so much so that I uh, I wrote him a letter Menotti when I was eight. Saying that I'm, I'm writing an opera too, and uh, I had this idea that that I should be writing an opera about Schubert because his life. I read about his life, and and uh, I, I don't know. I was eight, and he he answered my letter, and that was a big, that was a big deal for an eight year old, uh, just just starting to study the piano. I. Uh, I was surprised to hear back from him, and we he wrote back and said that he he answered my letter because I I go also and as a child only went by Toby, and he said I'm answering mm -hmm. your letter because Toby uh, is the central character, the deaf mute in uh, my opera, the medium. He didn't say yeah. deaf, and so that's why I answered you and. I had written and asked to meet him, and and uh, he he said he was sailing for France for his new, the premiere of his new opera, uh, which I think was the Globalings or Globalings, mm -hmm. um, and he'd be back in the fall. But I didn't know about follow up in those days, and I was happy just to get the letter, and uh, it didn't occur to me to pursue it, and so, uh, but. I think those influences, there were early, also, we were taught, I went to a very a progressive elementary school in Westchester, and um, the the art and music teacher teachers were very good friends, so they, they, they organized, they taught art and music in a kind of interdisciplinary way, so every year in fourth grade, when I was nine, uh, nine-year-olds were, were taught an opera. They chose an opera and we were taught an opera. We studied it and then we had, we chose a partner. Uh, my best friend and I uh, made maquettes and there was a school contest in for the, all the fourth grade class, classes who of the best maquette. And we, we studied Fanchula that year. And so, yeah. and we won the for best maquette. So we got to see Panchula at the Old Met, which was the only time I actually saw anything at the Old Met when I was nine. So there were these, there were these, uh, it was always- I'm trying guess, to think, that would have been either Dorothy Kirsten or Eleanor Stieber, probably. I think it was Dorothy Kirsten. Yeah. It was 63. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, they were, they, it was in the air, but I- I understood that it was something. It was an, an Everest for mm -hmm. a composer to to compose an opera, and 
I, 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 uh, so I, I put it on the back burner when I started studying piano and composition. And, uh, I just, um, I, I learned composition, uh, wrote, I wrote chamber music, piano music, chamber music, symphonic music, and a lot of it until I, uh, felt ready um, to take a break from the orchestra world, which is a completely different culture mm -hmm. that I've discovered than the opera world. And write my first opera at um, when I was 40. Uh, so it didn't, and I, that was the first opera. So, but I'd already written three symphonies and three piano concertos and, a lot of other stuff so i i had some some fluency with the orchestra with orchestration and um i have i was beginning to i would say feel uh, enough confidence about writing for orchestra that i could focus on learning how to write for the voice which mm -hmm. i'm just i'm still learning how to do after seven operas i hope always to get better at it and uh, as as i hope to get better at writing for the orchestra you, you never stop learning you, you know how to how to how to make things better michelangelo at the age of 82 wrote down on a on a sketch that he did on corda imparo i'm still learning and that was michelangelo at 82 so if he if he could do that i hold him up as a model for that Tobias, I'm going to make a general observation about your seven operas, of which I've seen five. Um, they all have really good stories. All of them. Because the two operas I've not seen, I know the stories very, very well. So therefore, in fact, better in some way than the other operas that you wrote. And therefore... I want to ask you, I mean, I can, you know, Verdi, who I revere, and Rossini, and Donizetti, and Wagner even, um, a lot of these guys pick stories that they would just sort of hang their music on and, and great singing and so forth. But as powerful theater, and I know the Wagner and Verdi people, of which I'm one, will attack me for this, but I'm going to say it anyway, there are stretches in Il Trovatore and Die Meisterzinger in certain works that really sag dramatically. And maybe La Battaglia di Legnano and work El Cida works like that. But your seven operas, the five I've seen, the stories are all terrific. They really are riveting and hold the stage as stories. Some of them have also been films. And I don't, you correct me if you think I'm wrong, I don't necessarily think that you drew from the films in your inspiration. I think you drew from the source material to make an opera rather than an opera version of a film. Am I correct? Oh yes, the the uh, if they were made into films, they were based on books, on novels. So my uh, source material was the was the novel, and those were, I had I obtained rights to the novel, not the film. So I was never operifying a film it a mm -hmm. film film all the films of of the subjects that i've written operas on are another interpretation of the, another take on the novel and the story than than mine there's no there may be intersections but there's no um i don't use the films to uh as 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 source material at all but I will say that at least two of them are among my favorite films and that the subject matter, the novel, the way the characters are defined in the novel also turned into terrific films in what's called A Place in the Sun, an American Tragedy, and Awakenings, which is one of my very favorite films of all. And there, we're going to talk about that later. But, but I, the, yeah. so you said you 
when you said you'd seen five of my seven operas, I assumed it was one through five, but actually you must have skipped one because Awakenings is number six. I know that. I've seen one through five. I've not seen Awakenings, your opera. Oh, you haven't seen Awakenings? Not oh. yet. I hope to. But um, I just know that that book based on by Oliver Sacks and the film directed by Penny Marshall, starring Robin Williams and Robert De Niro, is one of my very favorite films of all films. And I would love to see your opera because for many reasons, but one of them is because I know that you came to know Oliver Sacks, but we're going to talk about that later. Um, and Wait, how the fantasy and, and viewers can see Awakenings on my YouTube channel or anything okay. in my name and Awakenings opera, it will come up. It's a quite good that after our conversation. But let's start with your first opera back in 1996. Is it pronounced Emmeline or Emmeline? Emmeline. Emmeline. And I can say, because I looked at all the casts, you've had some terrific collaborators. And the woman who sang Emmeline is the great Patricia Rosette, the soprano, with whom you've worked more than once. When you created the opera Emmeline, was it with her in mind? Or did you create the opera and then Patricia Rosette came along? In the case of Emmeline, I had the idea to write an opera based on the story of Emmeline, um, specifically as told by Judith Rossner in her novel, Emmeline, from 1981. And after um, John Crosby uh, decided he wanted to commission it, um, then I was told that she would be Emmeline. I was I was just starting out so as an opera composer, so nobody was going to consult me on on who I thought should be cast, which is a very different story from what my how I function today with a, with an when opera. Sure. So but, just so people understand, this was at Santa Fe Opera in New Mexico, a wonderful summer festival founded in the late 1950s, where John Crosby for a very long time was the leader. He founded it. In he founded action. it, yeah. And, and your librettist was J.D., also known as Sandy McClatchy. Was, yeah. Did you pick him or was he picked for you? Oh, I chose him. I asked him to do it. And uh, he... Yeah, but I was I was going to just say about Pat Reset that she was assigned to to sing the role of Emmeline, and I did say, well, I would like to meet her and uh, hear her sing it. They and they and I was told, well, she wants she wants to meet you, and she also wants to see some some of your sketches, but there really were there wasn't really much to show her, and she. Uh, so we we made a, an appointment and she came over to my apartment and my studio and uh, one morning and uh, so I showed her a couple of ideas I had and she said okay that looks that looks fine and I said so um, would you like to uh, s sing something with me and she said are you out of your mind it's ten thirty in the morning. <laughs> me a bunch of cassettes <laughs> of her singing and said to, to listen to these and uh yes sandy mcclatchy my librettist i um i had uh, met him at um, joe, at, uh, joe, joe mackless's uh, i'm sure you knew joe mm -hmm. yes Joe Mackless was a musicologist who, who gave um, musicals at his uh, at his uh, beautiful apartment, which was only uh, for the purpose of of entertaining and and giving young musicians an opportunity to to try out their recitals or or before recording, and um, he was at one of those parties that everybody went to, and I I. Uh, we met and um, 
I asked him to do it. Uh, he had other another. He wanted to write an opera with me about um, some something else, but uh, Walt Whitman, mm -hmm. and he he pitched that to me, and I said that's interesting, but I don't think there's a story there, and um, I want to do Emmeline so. And he was, he was a he was a, a literary snob, so he was a very, um, very high end poet, and the editor in chief of the Yale Review, which published very uh, refined fiction and poetry and essays. So Judith Rosner, who was the author of Emmeline was a very successful commercial writer, not in the case of Emmeline, which wasn't, which was had been panned by the Times and basically killed, but she'd written a famous novel in the 70s called Looking for Mr. Goodbar. And that that made her famous. She sold it to the movies and Diane Keaton and Richard Gere, I think. Yes, Richard Gere. Uh, so she was from the uh, 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 another world, and he he felt it would be yeah beneath him, and his friend that his friends would. His... <laughs> I knew I, Sandy. <laughs> Ross, why would you want to do this? You know, I, <laughs> the story is the story is irresistible you know it's a, it's operatic it's a great story how, how can you deny that and I, I won't go into the rest of the conversation but i basically um i i basically i won the argument i checkmated him by bringing up uh other things that he had done uh and uh in, in his in his writing that and adaptations he had made that I could say the same thing about. Well, I don't want my friends to mock me for your having done that. <laughs> so he was the yes. He, I got off of the tangent there, but he was McClatchy was the librettist. Uh, he was he was a great he was a great brilliant brilliant man and a, a tremendously tremendously erudite. You don't meet. He, the, you don't meet it. if you meet an a, per, a, a person that erudite you, it doesn't get more erudite than than yep. and clever and witty and uh, and smart um, and charming and he wrote uh, he wrote the libretto for for uh, Emmeline and Dolores Claiborne and mm -hmm. I had this problem with him when I asked him to adapt a novel by Stephen King. Which, I can imagine same sort of uh, same sort of argument, but no. And once he read, the, once he allowed himself to read the stories, he, he agreed. You know, they were they were terrifically operatic. And well, um, in the case of Emmeline, it's really the re as you say, a retelling of the Oedipus myth from the point of view of the mother, and it's set in the eighteen forties in Massachusetts. It involves, as another one of your operas does, seduction by a, a supervisor in a workplace, uh, the impending birth of a child, um, an American tragedy, or known in the movies as A Place in the Sun, had similar themes in a lot of ways, but the outcome was different because the place and time and social class were very different in one or the other. Um in rehearsal in Santa Fe and developing this story in this opera, because it was your first opera, I'm not going to ask you the same question about all seven. What was it like for you as a new opera composer? What did you learn in rehearsal that you could not have anticipated? Oh, well, I, w I would say two, two things spring, many, many things, but two things, major things spring to mind. One, the first day uh, of rehearsal uh, of an opera, 
all of these singers who are your soloists, they would be the equivalent of of the soloists of the core, the core uh, in in any 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 abstract piece of music, non-operatic piece of music, um, are able to sing their roles off book, off without music, from memory. So they start first day of rehearsal from, from having absorbed as much as they could on their own about the character and everything that goes with it, their lives, their emotions, and and learn and knowing the music and words from memory. This this was this was an immediate immediate uh, stark difference between the world I had known and and the world of opera. Because in in if I if I would write I would write a symphony or something. And uh, an orchestra would pro would, that commissioned it would invite me to come to the premiere, and I would arrive and attend a rehearsal. There would be a day or two of rehearsals, and then the performance, and then I would then I would go home. Uh, and you know, I never really got to meet anyone. And these are full time orchestras, so the musicians have a different, they have a different part on their stand every day. Mm -hmm. In many cases, they don't know anything about what they're playing or you know, they're, it's just, they're just playing what's in front of them. The yeah. engagement, the involvement and engagement uh, of, uh, of sing singers and, and also then the, the, the orchestra that that, that plays there are a number of orchestra readings as they're called not rehearsals in, mm -hmm. in opera and there's just uh, much more involvement and engagement comparing it to orchestra culture i would say with chamber music it, it, it's a little bit different because chamber musicians do have the time to focus and uh uh, more time and uh, uh, on learning something, and they 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 are they they can be as engaged as as opera singers, but still they're not very very. I mean, it's un almost unheard of for for them to play a new piece by memory, um, especially one of any complexity. And I write fairly complex music, so the second difference that uh, second thing that struck me was that the the whole notion of collaboration i had been brought up in a um, by by uh, as a composer by very uh, strict um uh very very serious uh mm, composers in, in in the who but they were not they were not opera or theater composers so what i wrote if i wrote something that was that that was it there was no there was no discuss there would never be a discussion with a musician of about what i wrote they might complain about something but you know i was basically brought up to feel that the you know if i wrote a string quartet the, that's that's what it was i mm -hmm. learned to play what i wrote and there that's it but with with opera there is the opportunity to collaborate with singers uh with the conductor with the director uh especially and what what you have created as the composer going in is not the same thing is at least in at least for me and i think many of my colleagues at the more so in america than in europe um is not the same quite the, exactly the same thing as as it is coming out mm -hmm. so there's a new version of a new edition of uh 
every opera that I've written that comes out after the first performance um, and may, maybe some other versions after that. Um, but uh, so the idea of collaborating, the idea of a, of an, of a director suggesting to me, you know, I think you need to make a cut in this scene. That was uh, the first time I, I, that was suggested to me by Francesca Zambello as the first director of Emmeline. I was very upset and very insulted and uh, just confused and, and disturbed, traumatized, I would say. And re she really had to explain to me why I would say, why, why? You know, I spent a year, a year or two, right? She'd say, because when two, pe two, two people, uh, this is a spoiler alert, who are a, a woman and a man are, have just been told, who are married, have just been informed that they are in fact mother and son. And they did not know this before they lived together as a married couple for a year. They would not be having this eloquent conversation that your librettist, Mr. McClatchy, wrote for you to set. They would be, they wouldn't, they would barely be able to speak. They would be, words wouldn't be able to form. Um, they would be in shock. The music has to tell, has to, has to uh, ex ex explain what is going on for them, and it's it, it's not it's not a it's not a pretty conversation. Well, so I can I, I can uh, point to two other operas. This is like an opera quiz question for advanced beginners. Um, Le Nozze di Figaro, in which Figaro and Marcellina discovered that their mother and son. And Semiramide, which Semiramide and Idreno, I think is his name, um, discover that they're mother and son. And both Mozart and Rossini basically brought all their brilliant music to a halt because it was a moment of shock for both characters. And we had to watch, we audience members had to watch them register their shock. But the music did not necessarily have to present shock. It had to present dumbfounded silence. And well, then when Figaro uh, suddenly says, Mama, <laughs> and his whole relationship to her changes from antagonism to, to rediscovery of his mother. Um, friend, I'm going to make a comment about Francesca Zambella, with whom you've worked a lot. I've worked somewhat and know her well for many years. Um, she's a cutter. She's an editor. I've seen her on numerous situations say to me, um, Gee, I wish Rossini had cut that or Musorsi had cut that or Verdi had cut that because it doesn't belong and it slows down the opera. And I'm not advocating for cutting, frankly. I, I think that Verdi and Musorsi knew what they were doing. But um, I understand her impulse and how in the modern context for doing an opera that um, maybe audience members don't need the extended conversations they things need to move more quickly emotionally maybe our approach to material and subject matter has changed from the 1820s in which an audience would sit there and hear an extended aria of amazement and my goodness that's my mother mm. yeah but francesca is an editor innately i i know <laughs> there are times when she said to me that she wished that overture were not there we could just start the opera right away for a certain opera um yeah. your next opera which i mistakenly called the fantastic mr fox but it's not the it's fantastic mr fox is based on a book a children's book although i don't like that term a book by roald dahl which is favored by children and um it has a german version as well as an english version and it leads me to ask now that i know about your your parentage did you grow up speaking German at all? Did your grandfather speak German to you, or was that not part of the mix? I spoke a little. They spoke. They mostly spoke German to my with my mother when they didn't want us mm -hmm. to know what they were talking about. 
But I right. could identify the words to know they were talking about it the kinder. <laughs> Because I noticed that a couple of your operas at least have German versions. And that's, I that, was going to add that. That. that was translated into German. Yeah. Um, I think the others do. There's a, there, uh, Therese Racan was translated into French. Mm -hmm, that makes sense. But I'm not. We'll get to her in a moment. Mr. Fox, I want to stick with. Um, it premiered in Los Angeles. I I don't think I saw it there. I see my memory is I saw it with Rodney Guilfrey rather than Gerald Finley. Is that possible? Then I saw it with Gerald Finley and not remembering. It was Jerry Finley in LA. But I didn't see it in LA. I saw it probably in New York. Um it hasn't it hasn't ever been done in New York. Then I, I saw it somewhere and somehow I remember Rod Guilfrey, but anyway. It's no secret, because I've said it publicly many times, Gerald Finley is one of my very favorite opera singers. So that's why I think I would remember, but who knows? Um sang it in L.A., so if you didn't see it in L.A. Okay, I didn't see it in L.A. You um, heard radio broadcast from that. Could be. But anyway, talk how for your second, after the success of Emmeline, this is a very different direction, I think in terms of audience, in terms of subject matter, or perhaps not. How did you fix upon Fantastic Mr. Fox as your second opera? I I was hoping to write something for a little lighter than em Emmeline's very, very heavy. Um, yeah. Something lighter, something for children and families after Emmeline and serendipitously I received a letter shortly after the premiere of a uh, run of Emmeline at the Santa Fe Opera from uh, Donald Sturrock who is the artist was the artistic director of the Roald Dahl Foundation and which commissions several composers to do adaptations of Roald Dahl and uh, his biographer and 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 a librettist, he he wrote me a letter saying that he and Lissy Dahl, uh, Wald's widow, had been in the audience. Uh, they happened to be in Santa Fe, and then they happened to see Emmeline, mm. uh, and they were looking for a, a composer. They had they had approached Peter Hemmings at the L.A. Opera was the idea of commissioning an opera based on Fantastic Mr. Fox. And they were looking for a composer for it. And they had found, they were working with a composer and wasn't going well. And uh, as, as, uh, as I heard the story from them, after it was over, Lissy uh, Dahl turned to Donald Sturrock and said, why, why can't we have uh, Mr. Picker write Fantastic Mr. Fox. And he said, well, wh why not? Indeed, I'll ask him. And he wrote me a letter and it's with the libretto. Or maybe, no, he was he's British, too polite to send the libretto first. He just asked if I wanted, would be interested. And I said, yes, I would love to write an opera about, uh, a, a, an opera for the children could understand and adults could understand um, and send the libretto. And he did, and it was just charming and i just loved it and i said i i love this it's 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 funny it's touching it's charming it's beautifully written it's um it's sophisticated it's it's so that's how it came about and uh but it was actually commissioned by uh mrs roald Dahl for the los angeles opera and I, and and it was dedicated to, I dedicated to to her and to Roald in his memory. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just, I I don't know if I would have been able to 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 write an to get a, the the opportunity to write an opera for families after in line if if Donald hadn't if they hadn't written to me because I already had 
because of the success of Emmeline, um, already I already had commission uh, offers from the Dallas Opera and the Met. So, uh, I, it, I this came quickly after Emmeline, and it was to be premiered. Emmeline closed in August of ninety six, and this was for premiere in December of. 98 and i was able to do it i just start got started right away and did it very fast which is often the case uh i end up for some reason being the composer that has very little time to to give in to to write an opera now as a composer who i'm gonna use a term you understand and i think audiences will too created a very distinctive sound world in emmeline the sound world of Fantastic Mr. Fox is really quite different, I think. And when you began drafting music for Fantastic Mr. Fox, what were your sources of beginnings? Was it the, the libretto? Was it one character? Was it your musical vocabulary? Which, which came to four? I think that the... That the story and the and the the storytelling through the words tapped into a a musical vein in, in that was already there in me that I was able to it opened it opened that vein um, because the words required a, a music that could be could be light and witty and and also but also weird and scary mm -hmm. like oh, doll. I wanted yeah. to I was inspired by doll and I was and I and the story and 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 the character the characters the characters uh, really are different from the characters of Emily, and there's hard to, it's hard to draw any parallels between them. Um, you know, there's no singing hedgehog or porcupine <laughs> Emmeline, or um, singing the, I, the tractors and diggers, the, le the lesbian farm equipment. It, it's a very, <laughs> actually a very, it's a very funny opera, and it has le le levels of meaning. The the words mean mean one thing to children and another thing to adults. To which I would observe, and I mean this is a very big compliment, that the music has levels of meaning for adults and for kids. I, I never feel with Fantastic Mr. Fox, it's a kid's opera. Certain works you feel are composed for children, no, directed at children. It was very much the brief. Uh, it was very important to the doll, to do, the dolls that, uh, and to Donald who represented the the Fab Foundation, that this be written for this be a family opera, and mm -hmm. the term family opera wasn't really even used then, and the idea of presenting the family opera was it was there was a lot of resistance in the opera world to that either it was an opera for grown-ups or for children but we wanted to write an opera that was for you could you know your grand grandparents could take their grandchildren and not be bored mm -hmm. highly entertained yeah and, um so it's not, it's by no means, no, it, children's, it would be an insult to Fantastic Mr. Fox to call it a children's opera. I think so. Misrepresentation. Because it's, it's the, the humor in it. I mean, it's just some very adult subjects that are addressed mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot. Um, musically, though, I, mean, I don't think any composers, uh, Sound world is going when when writing. If you put a tragedy next to a comedy, 
that the comedy is going to, well, you should be able to tell it's the same composer, but yeah, they're, they're going to run to write something that, that's, um, that gives the listener a, a, a different kind of catharsis. Mm -hmm. Well, I would push back and just say that your grandfather's Wagner, that was a whole big sound world. And even if um, parts of all sounds very different from Tannhäuser in certain ways, and Rienzi sounds very different from Tristan and so forth. Um, nonetheless, you you're playing in the same stadium with with Herr Wagner, whereas other composers, I would say you among them, based on the work of yours, I know. Your sound world is a lot more diverse and not as predictable, if that's a word that we like or don't like, but. I'm pleasantly surprised and, and beguiled, in fact, with each opera of yours I hear because it's a new sound world based on the story. And as I asked you at the very beginning, all of the stories are so strong that you've chosen that that, to me, at least seems to be the driving force for your way into the composition of the operas that you undertake. Yeah. Especially the next one which Therese Raquin, which is a fabulous opera. It was a great film in France, but many people haven't seen it in the non-French speaking world. Um, it's based on a novel by Emile Zola. Um, it's a story, let's call it at its most basic of infidelity. infidelity. Uh, there's a mother-in-law. It could be on the most basic level a very Puccini-esque story um, and nothing not to knock Puccini, but um, he would often suss out just the issues of his leading character. In this case, had he written Therese Raquin, it would have been all about her. When you undertook the opera, um, Madame Lisette Raquin, the mother-in-law, is at least as powerful to me as Therese Raquin and the husband Camille, the lover Laurent, um, everyone had a very powerful image in that opera to me. And what made it riveting was it's not that I always waited for Therese to come back, but that everybody captured my attention. It's like Verdi's Don Carlo, that I care about all the characters and not just the lead the way I might with uh, Tosca. There's only seven characters in it, so and no chorus, so it's 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 an intimate piece. It's an, an ensemble piece. So it's uh, everyone, everybody. I took special care that everybody in, in the opera has an arc of some kind. And uh, yeah, but there are, there are many uh, film and theatrical adaptations of Therese Raquin. It was all of, most of Zola's operas, uh, I'm sorry, most, Zola made most of his novels in, also into plays. And the play, the, the version of, of uh, Therese Raquin was the most successful and is still played. Um, and there, oh, there are many versions of it. And there, uh, there have been a lot of films. There's the one with Simone Signorette. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> there, there also, there have been there have been other films. There's, there's an American one, a uh, completely different setting that I I came across just channel surfing on the Hallmark uh, Entertainment made. Charles Ludlam, the... Uh, yes, the, I saw that. The Ridiculous the, Theater Company. I In January, my guest was the wonderful actor, playwright Charles Bush. And so, we spoke about Charles Ludlam for people who didn't know him. And he and he did um, artificial jungle, which is Therese Raquin, which takes place in a pet store. <laughs> and instead of drowning Camille in the Seine, they would drown him in the piranha tank. <laughs> oh, they uh, smother him with a pillow, and they hide, <laughs> hide the body in the piranha tank. Um, I have. I would love for you to say anything about the genesis of that opera, but I had two very specific questions. One of them, it was directed by, again, by Francesca Zambello. 
working with someone you'd worked with before, especially someone as as august as she is and i mean that in the best way she's been on my program i've done stuff with her in washington um did you take her editorial recommendations more to heart or did did she recommend anything or did you anticipate her cutting and you you wrote in a tight way well it got i think i I got better each with each opera. Um, cutting, we no. She, um, I think after the first, the first of first production, we met and talked about making some revisions with my librettist Gene Shear, and we we changed we. we 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 took an RN, put it somewhere else. But there were I don't recall I don't recall that she she'd asked for any cuts in Therese, actually. Um so and it is and it's no, I don't think it, it needs cutting. And it's been done. I maybe my most performed opera. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. um, but it has. So of course, it's only seven singers. So the smaller the opera, the more likely it is to be performed, and sure. at least well everywhere, but especially in America. My second question regarding this opera, this experience, I've never asked anyone before because the circumstances never come up. Uh, it premiered in Dallas on November 30th, 2001. You're a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker. On September 11th of 2001, we had all the events that the world knows here in New York City. And um, I knew 12 people who were killed. I knew many more people who were directly affected. I had, on September 30th of that year, the opportunity for a terrific job in Australia at the opera there. And I'd never been to Australia. I had blocked three months and I was looking forward to the whole experience of discovering Australia and travel and everything was laid out. For the only time in my career, I canceled my contract because I felt I couldn't leave New York at that time. It was not about fear. It was just that I had not processed, I had not digested i felt there was so much that had to be addressed here politically it was very fraught for all kinds of reasons and i i deeply was sorry for many reasons i didn't go to australia the good job number one but number two i've always wanted to go there and i've never been there um but the first job i took was a short one in brussels in december of 2001 but it was only about a week and i felt i could get away for a week but um what was it like as a New Yorker, as someone we had the whole world, but we especially in New York underwent a catastrophe. It was very personal for everyone. The fires did not go out in the World Trade Center site until December 16th of 2001. So we saw the flame. We could smell it. People were being withdrawn from the, the site. 500 people were lost and it was awful. It was operatic. And how did you feel about leaving New York then, about working on something new, on this powerful, wonderful opera that I, I've come to love, uh, that I saw in Montreal, by the way, and I think again in San Diego, but certainly in Montreal. Um, and how did you feel leaving New York at that point and, and working on an opera when you were a thousand miles away when we in real time were still living those events every day here. Uh, when did you say the premiere was of Therese? November 30th, 2001. I was already a couple of months. Uh, well, uh, I, I was, I was very, Afraid of, I was afraid of my fear of flying came back, but in a whole new way. 
So it was, I was afraid to get on a plane. Um, and it, it was a scary time. There was never any discussion or consideration of canceling the premiere in late November because of 9-11. Um, during rehearsals, I remember, uh, must have been the beginning of November or late October, right when they started, there was a terrible plane crash in Long Island and uh, a plane crashed into many homes and it was uh, like a, an Armageddon. And I remember, you know, telling Francesca that this had happened. And we were both, we, there was a, you know, there, we, were, we, we felt very paranoid about what, what was gonna happen next. Um, I didn't feel that, and you know that I was needed in New York, of to do anything, and uh, and I I wanted to I wanted just to, to life to go on, mm. and and to be to to, to be part of the of the life of, of 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 life lives that go on because that's what we have to do no matter what happens and that's what we did also during and after the pandemic yeah. um cataclysmic events that uh we've experienced you know these are the cataclysmic events of our era you, know, you can point to cataclysmic events of the previous eras too, mm -hmm. but I, I think I was, I, I, I went, to, I went down to the site, and and saw the saw it burning. Mm -hmm. I, the whole thing was so, oh, just appalling and. What was, what was going on politically? Um, but also, also, well, at that time, at that time, it was it hadn't really, it, it changed after that. But mm -hmm. there was this. There was a moment right after nine eleven, as you you'll recall, when there was a feeling of unity in the yeah. country, um, and that. Uh, that felt good. That uh, didn't last. I mean, no. last long enough for the Democrats to support the, the Iraq War. Yeah, which changed the world yet again in horrific ways. We're still paying for. Um, I want viewers to know that that plane crash you refer to was a flight bound for the Dominican Republic. And as far as we know, there was no terrorism, nothing involved. It was just, unfortunately, a plane crash, birds going into the engines, apparently. And um, But at that time where everything was so heightened and everything we felt musically, artistically, politically, medically for so many people, um, I know people in your life are medical professionals and they dealt with all of this in a major way as they did again with the pandemic. And living well, with people who are that is very profound. It, you know, the, I, I was, I was a, and I, I remember sitting in New York in October, sitting at a outdoor restaurant, and when a plane would go overhead, I, I was, I was afraid. Yeah. Um, but you know, my. Uh, husband, a partner of 44 years as a physician at Mount Sinai Hospital. He's also a very accomplished writer and and now my librettist. He was called in on 9-11 um, to, to wait to be at Mount Sinai to wait, wait, await the ambulances. And I remember his going there and waiting and waiting and nobody came. Yeah. There were very, very few people that 
Uh, even in, even in the hospitals downtown. Yeah, right? I went downtown. We both live uptown. I went downtown to volunteer at St. Vincent's Hospital, which would have been the receiving hospital for many. Right. And no one, no one came. That that to me was. I mean, there's a story somewhere there about the anticipation of receiving the dead and injured, and no one came. Yes, it, it was a, a very existential <laughs> sub opera that would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyway, I I only mention that because I remember profoundly my. It's not that I didn't feel creative. I certainly did. But I felt that I had to put that aside at that moment and do other things that were just very immediate about my city. And I yet I know many people, yourself included, who practically insisted on moving on with their creativity because that was the way to reply to such horror. And I, I, I respect that. No choice. I Yeah, I respect I, that completely. The piece was finished anyway. Yeah, I, good. <laughs> but no, I didn't. I didn't compose anything in that period. I was yeah. there for rehearsals, but I, I mean, I was contractually obligated to to be in mm -hmm. that. So now your next opera is very close to home to me because it was commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera. It's the theater I worked at for many years. Um, it was an American tragedy, a classic American novel based on the novel by Theodore Dreiser. It became the famous film A Place in the Sun, starring Montgomery Clift, Elizabeth Taylor, and Shelley Winters. And it's a very American story, to me, even more than The Great Gatsby, which somehow it has certain things in common with The Great Gatsby as a story. But I find the American, I find the Great Gatsby more about the language of the of the writer, whereas I find the story of an American tragedy a lot more compelling. Um, about social striving, about different classes, Emmeline in a different way, um, but really about the fact that what certain young men who are from the working classes are told that they're expected to do to get ahead. Um, how certain people who are wealthier have a sense of entitlement that makes them immune to what, quote, real people have to deal with in their lives. The way women had very few options back then, and, you know, they're still have to fight for everything now. Um, but without underlining any of that, I never felt that Dreiser or you in your opera or George Stevens in his film had to do any underlying it was just there in the material and it worked so well for me as as an opera when i went to see it at the Met. i was so thrilled that you got to do an opera at the metropolitan opera starring patricia Rossette, susan graham nathan gunn jennifer larmore dolores ajik richard bernstein a friend of mine william burden kim begley a fabulous cast anna christie and james Levant, james conlin conducting rather and another friend of mine. And so I was following it very closely in its genesis because, you know, it's close to where I live and I knew many of the people who were involved in the very beginning. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had that commission after Emmeline or it came soon after. Um, they, it, it, it was brewing. It, it came... Mm -hmm. Um, officially, when uh, Jimmy Levine uh, asked me to lunch, I, I must have been in '98, um, and asked if I would consider writing an opera for the Met, which uh, I certainly wanted, very much wanted to. They'd it'd been, they 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 came. To they came to see Emmeline. They were, they they really were very careful of, in those days about what they commissioned because it was really the beginning of commissioning at the Met after a long, long period of no commissioning. So, um, 
yeah, it was it was a it was a journey. The 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 the, the arriving at what to compose for the Met. Uh, I I went through many different subjects, um, and originally, well, the first thing I wanted to do was an American tragedy, but I couldn't get the rights, mm. so. So I was going to do Sister Carrie, and then I was going to do a Stefan Zweig novel, Be Her Pity. Um, and the you know, other things... It certainly would have appealed to James Conlon in a particular way. Well, the, the Zweig, well, yeah. that, that, was, that, was what, that was what Jimmy Levine wanted the okay. most. He was... It, Jimmy Conlon wasn't involved yet. And okay. Mine was to conduct the premiere at that time when the late uh -huh. night hadn't gotten the Boston Symphony directorship yet. So, and he wanted, he really wanted this, the Stefan side, but I couldn't, I couldn't, um, I'd, I, every opera that I've done, I, it's, it's, I have to know that, that it will be, I have to know that it it's almost has to be proven in advance that it's a stage worthy mm -hmm. story. And um, I felt that Beware of Pity was, well, well, I saw the film of it and I thought, I thought it was just terrible. <laughs> and it made, it, it's, it scared me about, about doing an opera on, on the story. Um, also, it was writing about people in the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, was felt to me too much, too, too distant from my own experience. Yeah. Um, and I could, I, I wanted to write something that I, I could directly identify with more. So that was an American tragedy. Mm -hmm. Eventually I got the rights from, because I, I met Theodore Dreiser's nephew and mm. he was very, very old and he, uh, the reason I couldn't get the rights was that it had been optioned uh, for a musical by by Lee Adams and Bob Strauss uh -huh. and Bye Bye Birdie and what I, <laughs> lots of big hits this would have been Bye Bye Roberta <laughs> Bye Bye Fly <laughs> 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 but uh no they they could never get it together but we just did we split off the rights uh, yeah. Brad rights from the, the musical rights uh, somehow because because Dreiser's nephew really wanted it to happen and uh and so it did because I worked with them and I know well their rehearsal process and the the I don't want to say the grandeur but the largeness of the institution and the potential for creation and the gorgeousness of the orchestra and the the size of the stage which is a very different animal from things that you did before san francisco would be coming in san francisco is a big stage but la's stage is not quite that stage and dallas is not and nothing is quite that stage when you walked into that auditorium with 3,786 seats and you heard the gorgeous acoustic and you saw this massive stage and you saw their potential for lighting and costumes and every technical aspect, how did that, if it did, reconfigure your perception of your opera and how it would be presented there? Well, I... First of all, I uh, w once the commission, you know, what we always have to be careful. The old cliche: "Be careful what you ask for, because you you may get it." Once I had it, and I went to the day I went to the first opera I'd been to since since receiving the commission. I was terrified, and I was I, I was found it very daunting to go to the Met. And they they wanted me to come and see every 
as many operas as I, any time I wanted to come. I, Sarah Billinger said, this is your house. You, just, you come whenever you want. And I did. I went a lot until until it didn't scare me to, to go there. But it did. It scared me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, intimidating. Um, I, 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 but eventually, you know, I, I just... I found reassurance in my in the the actual act of composing the piece, mm -hmm. working on the piece, making it, trying to make it work, uh, and just just writing it uh, and living my life. It was inevitable. Once I signed the contract, there was no going back. Mm -hmm. I eventually grew more and more comfortable going to the Met. And um, when once we started or rehearsing there, uh, well, it was it just was a wonderful place to work. Uh, it is. Um, it brought you back together with Patricia Rossette. And um, you had worked with her before, but now you and she were both in very different positions in your careers she being a major star I mean, she was a rising star i think when you first met her but by this point they would build whole opera productions around her uh famous madame butterfly famous for all kinds of work that she did and now she's a wonderful stage director but did you compose the role of roberta alden with patricia has said in mind the voice the character more than you did the first time with emmeline all of all of the um, roles were all of the composition uh, the composition of every character. Was, I knew who the singers were going to be, so I d I was writing for all of them, mm -hmm. in mind. And the producer said very much so, um, and uh, yeah, I mean we by then. I I wrote uh, after I gave her she has a, she has an aria that another she had a, a letter aria in Emmeline she, I gave her another letter aria which opens Act Two of an American Tragedy and after I gave it to her she said we need to get together and talk and she came over and basically we we just we worked on it and. We, re, we rewrote it together so that it would be better for her voice mm -hmm. and better for anyone's voice. So uh, she was she was very really help, helpful in that way. And um, <laughs> Susan Graham there, there is a trio in Act Two with Nathan Gunn, Susan Graham, and Pat Reset. And I had uh, written, Susan has some amazing, uh, at that time, uh, probably still a high B flat, high B. Yeah, she, I'm sure she still does. <laughs> and so did, of course, Dolores Ogic in her own way. But there's in the trio, uh, there was a, a moment when when the Metza when Susan Graham was higher uh, singing the high high B, I think, uh, and and soprano Patricia Reset was uh, underneath, and she said, "That's she's singing minor. I'm the soprano. <laughs> that needs to be rethought. <laughs> Young job, not the Mets." Um. Since you mentioned her and I was going to, Dolores Ajik. Uh, is the character pronounced Elvira or Elvira? Probably Elvira. Well, we call we called her Elvira. Elvira, okay. Um, was this your first time working with Dolores, who is a phenomenon? Yes, it was. Yes. 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 He, I... I asked her before I, before I wrote 
you know, I I talk to all the singers about their ranges and their money notes and all. And I asked her if, if she had a high C, and she said, no, oh, yes. <laughs> and I, um, I, I, so I used it, and she had a an aria in in an American tragedy, the, the jail aria, um, where she she has to jump up from a low B or B flat to a high C, and she attacked it. She took the note with a, a pianissimo and and it and it grew and she held it and then and then you know she did a hairpin yeah as well. she went louder and then softer and a long time she held it uh and on the word god which i tend to usually i usually set on the on on c um uh it stopped the show when she finished the aria. It stopped the show. Yeah, it stopped the show. Quite a while. If yeah, you know, that was thrilling. She was a once in gener. I say was because she's retired. A once in a generation artist, uh, who really, uh, you know, famous for her Verdi and and Italian dramatic repertory, but also a lot of iconic modern American roles that she's less known for. Um, I want, because of time, to cover all your operas, because the next one I was at the premiere of, it was in San Francisco, was Dolores Claiborne. It brought you back together with Sandy McClatchy as librettist, as you said, adapting a Stephen King novel, of all things. Um, I'm going to let you tell the story. The opera Dolores Claiborne had a very particular genesis in history and events that happened as it came to the stage. Would you talk about that? You mean how Stephen King came to write it? Well, whatever you want to do, that, but also the rehearsal process and the singers who were in it and so forth. The genesis... Well, I, I, it was originally... I originally wanted... To, to write several, I wanted to do several, several Stephen King operas, a group of them, and I wanted it to be called The King Cycle. Mm -hmm. and I posed that to, to Placido Domingo, and at that time, Christina Shepelman, who was running the Washington, Washington. Opera. Yeah. They said, how about doing, because I had the rights to Dolores Claiborne and Misery, how about doing doing those in as two one acts? Mm -hmm. And I called Jean Shear, who was who was writing the libretto then, and I said, can we do that? And he said, yeah, we'll figure out a way. Yeah, we can do it. Because my idea was to have uh, Placido, have Pat Reset play uh, the, the Kathy Bates character right in Misery, in misery. And yep. Playboy. and the these were two the, these two books were tied together in a way because so Tobias the sound dropped a bit. Who is Dolores Claiborne? Uh, Pat Pat Reset was going to be both the, roles. The both roles, both Kathy Bates roles in in Dolores Claiborne, and in Misery, in Dolores Claiborne, Placido was going to conduct, and Misery. He was the idea was he was going to be the writer and and sing and I uh, that role, and I was going to conduct. Okay. Uh, and that if people don't know in th that story, the writer is handicapped in bed, and and the woman who shows up is sort of your fan from hell <laughs> and calls him Mr. Man and so on. And it's, it's very creepy in a wonderful operatic way. Um, okay, go ahead. Well, 
it didn't happen. To make a long story short, that didn't happen because the recession came and things changed in Washington. Uh, many reasons. I think also Marta Domingo did not and did not like the idea of Placido playing a character that smashes a woman's head in with a and kills her with a typewriter. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it was it, it, the whole they he left Washington and Christina left so it just did, didn't happen and uh, and so I offered it to David Gockley at the San Francisco Opera and and I said um, you know I like actually I had yeah I, I'd like to write it for Patricia Reset. Dolores Claiborne. And he he uh, he wanted Dolores Ajik to play Dolores Claiborne. Right. Um because he felt that she looked I guess she looked like Kathy Bates a little bit. Right. And but so we disagreed about that and uh and it didn't happen. So, uh, and I, I, I went off and wrote a, a big piano quintet with the Ventana string quartet and Sarah Rothenberg and Da Comer and a, a new a second string quartet. I, I wrote a bunch of things, and then, uh, but I, I still wanted to do Dolores Claiborne. And so a few years later, I called him up and said, "Oh, um, look." If you want to do Dolores Claiborne, it's your opera house. Cast whoever you want. You're in charge of casting, and so, so then, so it was written. I wrote it for Dolores Ajit, and uh, um, when it was in rehearsal, uh, it was already several years after eight years eight years after she had sung an American tragedy at the Met uh, when it was in rehearsal it it became apparent that it was it was even for even for the un unparalleled technique of Dolores Ajik it was she it was not really singable for her mm -hmm. and she uh um so uh, to make a very long story short again uh it ended up that patricia reset did sing the, pre the premiere of, of dolores Claiborne on um, on very short notice and Kathy uh, Cook. Kathy Cook was yep. second Dolores, and she sang two performances, and that fabulously, actually. Yeah, I mean, it was sing it is singable. It's very, very hard. There are certain people who can sing it. Um, Lisa Chavez sang mm -hmm. the chamber version. She sang the chamber version uh, with New York City Opera later, and. So, yes, it was a it was a change in, in the rehearsal process that I I had never experienced that before, and was a was just a very it was very difficult because I then then I had to make millions and millions of adjustments for Patricia for her voice. Mm -hmm. So. Part and of then, why I ask you that is I was privy to a lot of what was going on, but as a very famous opera singer colleague of of ours says about me that Fred Plotkin is a vault. <laughs> if I know something, it doesn't mean I'm supposed to talk about it. And I felt that if you wanted to talk about it, I'd give you the opportunity to talk about it. But I remember everything going on at that time because... I remember the very quick turnaround that you and Pat Reset had had to do and 
Delora, who I know and knew then, and and um, it was a challenge for even for opera professionals at that time to make it happen in a very short time frame, and it did happen, and it was very gripping. But I also had the feeling that Patricia was said being a soprano that you probably had to make adjustments from the role that was written for a, a rich mezzo with a, with a big high extension. Oh, yes. Yeah. A lot of adjustments. Yeah. A lot of adjustments. Yeah. Mostly, mostly I had to take things down. Yeah. Because, because the top, the, the the high things were also uncomfortable for Pat. Um, mm -hmm. All of them, not all of them. But she, I remember there was a party after opening night. Ruth Ruth Bader Ginsburg was my guest at the opening, and we it was it was it was a wonderful occasion, a very happy opening night. But I remember at the party. Pat said, you know, said, we hugged and kissed as we always do and did. But uh, I said, so, well, you you did it. You got through it. She had 12 days or something to yeah. win this. Yeah. <laughs> Matthew Ozawa, who's now a famous director, was assistant director to Jim Robinson then. And he was he was hiding in the scenery, throwing her lines, prompting her. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I said, you did it. And she said, Yes, but and she 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 poked me in the chest and said, "You're a high note addict. That's what you are." <laughs> um, it's true. There are too many. There are too many high notes in Dolores Claiborne in Vera's part too. So, if if it's when Vera was sung by Elizabeth Futrell, who does have a, a high voice. Yes, she does. She does. It was at the end of her career. So, yeah. So if were, I'm correct, she now teaches at Peabody, I think. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. She was a great she was great to work with. But you know, the top wasn't as easy then right. as it had been in her prime. And I but I still think if it's if it's ever done again, I, I am going to I will I'm gonna rewrite those those two parts so that mm -hmm. they're they're not as uh, they're terribly hard. Yeah. Just terribly hard. I'd like to get now to the two operas of yours I've not seen. One of them I feel very close to the story for all kinds of reasons. One is my reverence for the late Dr. Oliver Sacks, who was a presence in New York City. He was he was British. He was a Jew. He was gay. But he somehow made New York his home. He lived in California for a while. He rode motorcycles. He had a <clears throat> a different youth than the man we came to know with the beard and the the sensitivity and the poetry of his language and his beautiful writing and his exploration of the human mind. He wrote a wonderful book called Musicophilia, um, which I think I could recommend to every single person. Um, all of his books were case studies but they were so in my view humane and they were not just cases sometimes you read dr freud and other people and they're very clinical with oliver Sacks, he gave a humanity to every person the way verity gave a humanity to every person and um so that just starting with that uh awakenings is my favorite of his books even more than music of Velia. um he Another thing he and I had in common, Oliver, I, I mean, Tobias, I don't know if you did. Um, there are those of us in the world who love herring. And there's a herring society in New York City for her herring lovers. And we were both members of the herring society. But um, I don't know if you ever ate herring with him, but um, he could write eloquently just about herring. In fact, there was once a piece in the New Yorker about him and his relationship to Herring, but that that's an aside. Um, Awakenings, talk about how it came to pass, talk about the relationship you developed with Oliver Sacks, 
whatever you want to say. I'd love to hear everything. And then I will watch the opera. He he was a I met him. I wanted to meet him, um, but Judith Rossner, who had written the book, Emmeline, and I became very close friends. And in the early 90s, when I was writing in Emmeline, I uh, somehow, he, he, this uh, it came up that, that a close mutual friend of theirs, that they had a close mutual friend. And I, I wanted to meet him Oliver Sacks because I had I I had I'd been I suffered with an, a neurodivergent uh, a neurodivergence called Tourette syndrome my since at the age of five or six and I always I was always trying to find somebody to help me with it because there's very really very little help for it. And so I thought maybe he could help me because he had been, he had written about it a lot, and um, I knew that he was he was very compassionate. I didn't really know his compassion personally until I we became friends. But so so we were introduced. Um, he came to a, I gave a dinner party and he came, and uh, and we became we became friends. Very good, very very good friends. And he helped me, not as my physician, just as as a friend, come to terms with my Tourette's syndrome and to just be able to accept it more and uh, feel that it was. Um, he thought it. He thought it that my creativity uh, sprang from it, possibly, but. Um, so I, he, he, he became as enamored of some of my music as I had of his work, his work. And uh, he refers to uh, really my, in a way, my first opera, it's a piece for actor, a narrator and orchestra called the Encantadas. And he, he loved that piece. Sir, Sir John Gielgud had recorded it and um, it's, it's based on Herman Melville's writings about the Galapagos, and he he refers to it in one of his books, um, the I Island of the Colorblind, and and acknowledged that it had been it was something he was listening to all the time. He was obsessed with this piece, and uh, so he whenever he could, he would come. Whenever there was a premiere, he would come to to. to see my operas and he came and stayed with us in Santa Fe for a week for the premiere of Emmeline and, and you know he was he was so appreciative and so uh, and, you know encouraging to me he was just a great friend came to Therese Reckin when it was done in New York he came to American Tragedy and I, I don't know at some sometime we were having dinner and we, uh, I used to, you know, tell tell him how much how beautiful what a, that his writing was really a form of art, and really I thought of him as an artist as much as I did a scientist and a phenomenologist, an observer, uh, and that I I wanted him actually, to, I wanted him to narrate the Encantadas, but because he loved it so much but he was afraid to do to do the, the he thought he would he was very shy and he thought it would yeah be able to pull it off and so then i said well may, i or may, i don't remember if he suggested or i suggested that i adapt one of his works as an opera and um i think we talked about what and he said that that would be that would be great and we talked about what would be the most stage worthy. And I think, I believe it was Oliver's idea to, that I should do Awakenings. 
and may I just ask, was Awakenings earlier a ballet done in Britain in near Manchester in about 2010? Yes, it was uh by music by you, I mean. Yeah. Yes. I I couldn't he he you know be, he gave me the rights and I I pitched it to the Met and mm -hmm. wanted it to be done to the Met and the uh it didn't happen there. I pitched it in when at that time David Gockley was in Houston to him. He didn't know who Oliver Sacks was. Oh. And anyone else I mentioned it to in the opera world, they said, Well, it's not an opera. How would that be an opera? So I gave up on it. And mm -hmm. uh instead you know the whole book is about movement and the and the absence of movement, the presence of movement. Different, so it seemed a, a natural thing to, to be very unusual and interesting ballet. So it, uh, that was and that was eventually that. So I it was commissioned for the Rambert Dance Company and it became picture mm -hmm. uh, work the 10 11 season and so they it opened in manchester but they toured it all over the uk 80 80 venues with the live chamber orchestra mm -hmm. um it was oliver came to to see it in england and um he didn't ballet dance well it wasn't ballet it's modern dance but dance dance was not something that oliver really could relate to i so, agree <laughs> It's very, always when are they going to sing already? <laughs> he still was, yeah. He still, <laughs> still was, you know. He he was very interested in it, and then, um, then it was unfortunately not until after he died in two thousand fifteen that. Uh, when, when Jim Robinson, the artistic director of Opera Theatre St. Louis, which is a, one of the best uh, festivals in America, which is famous yeah. for hearing new work, learned from me that I had the rights to Awakenings and wanted, had been looked, we'd been looking for a subject to, to do there because they revived Emmeline in 2015. And they wanted a new opera. Uh, when I, and uh, we'd gone through all kinds of subjects. We'd even, he and McClatchy and I developed an entire treatment and scenario for a sequel to Emmeline, which was going to be called Matthew. And, uh, but when he heard that I had awakenings, he said, that's it. That's what, that's what I want to do that. So, so I got to do it. And it was with uh, Jared, Jared Porter sang the role and he really wanted to do it. And he just, he never knew Oliver, but he really studied, he studied him, he studied everything he could get his hands on. And he, in the in the final analysis was channeling Oliver Sacks and it was utter, he was utterly convincing. I was convinced and other people who were close to to Sachs, who were there, were convinced that that was really him. He, he has a pro. He has a. He's the pro. He's kind of the star of the. Yeah. You know, as he is in the book, it's based. Well, on I'm going to ask you a question because I've not seen your opera, but it's something that I've thought about a lot, having read Awakenings, having really been a follower of Doctor Sachs. Um, it's a story, it's based on the fact that there was a, a pandemic of what's called sleeping sickness, encephalitis lethargica from 1916 to 1927. And many thousands were left sort of in hospitals and facilities, in this case, in City Island in the Bronx, in New York City. And Dr. Sachs, who arrived decades later, treat, saw these patients um, and they were sort of forgotten people who were just tended to, but the term that was used was they were frozen. They were sort of living statues. And what I've always wondered, and I never got to ask Oliver Sacks this, is 
he helped use drug therapy that helped bring some of these people out of their frozen states and beautifully enacted in the film by Robert De Niro, whose face I will never forget in the moment of a certain kind of lucidity. Um, that, And then, he, unfortunately, he regresses. Is I've always wondered whether these patients had memories from the lives before they became ill or whether the memories were raised and therefore you as an opera composer, would you present them with memories and, or whether, and, and your husband did the libretto, would you talk about his medical life and, and therefore why he was a wonderful choice to do this libretto and what he brought to it medically in the exploration of what is a medical topic? Well, to go, to, you know, to go to answer your last question first, he uh, had not written a libretto before, and um, Sandy McClatchy was going to write the libretto, but he died, yeah. uh, and before he could write it, and I was looking for a new librettist and. It was, he was right under my nose all along. And he had written very successful uh, first novel, which came out the same. He finished the, the same day I finished Emmeline. So it was in the late 90s. And two subsequent novels and book and collection of short stories. And um, he's also, his, he has two careers. The other is as a neuroradiologist at Mount Sinai Hospital. So he's he's a brain, he's a as a neuroscientist, basically brain brain doctor, and um, so he understood. He he knows the science, and and when and reading and doing research on it, he 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 understands it as a as a practitioner, but also as a poet, as a because he's a he's a very lyric writer. So the 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 poetry that he he uh, that. It appears in his prose, um, is in the, is was brought out in the libretto as well as his knowledge of the very very clear knowledge of 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 all the available uh, information data that could be obtained about the myst this mysterious illness which nobody knows what the cause of was. Um, and nobody knows whether it will ever come back. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver believed he had no, he didn't have any proof. He just had this into an intuition that it had been um, somehow tied in or an aftershock or rel related to the Spanish flu epidemic, which mm -hmm. received, they overlapped. Yeah. And there were, I think, millions who, who were died from the sleepy sickness. And these people you referred to as being where were, the survivors were just warehoused and put away for 40 years because they were frozen. They couldn't talk. They couldn't move. Um, and uh, they had, so that was at Arie's first libretto and it, he then did the next, and now doing the next, and he's he's a great librettist. Uh, but the they did have memories of the of their past, and when they awakened, uh, one one character, Rose, uh, who was the role was originated by um, Susanna. Um, Guzman? No, no, that was Mrs. Fox. Right, okay. <laughs> Anna, Phillips? Phillips. Yeah. Susanna Phillips, wonderful soprano. Then reprised by Joyce L. Corey in Boston. Mm. Rose Rose wakes up and she's they're awakened by by give, being given this a dosage of L-dopa, which was a new drug given for Parkinson's at the time. That, and they they awaken, and she she felt that 
she know she knew it was 1969, but it, she still felt it was 1926, mm -hmm. and she was frozen in that year. Mm -hmm. uh, if the patients were aware, they, they had an awareness of things going on around them, but they couldn't participate, and yeah. they were they were living they were living in a different in a different dimension, but they they did they did have memories. And she she sings at the end at the end of Act One of that about uh, she was to be she was engaged to be married. And she remembers she remembers her fiance mm -hmm. appears in her imagination at the end of Act One. And she she thinks he's there. So there he is. But of course, he, they all, no one, they couldn't, these people couldn't function at all. So their families couldn't take care of them. And some of the families- And their families were 40 years older. And many of them dead. Right, yeah. Way. Um, <laughs> so, or divorced, and had, some of them had divorced the people who were, they were married to who were in this state because they were hopeless. They were considered, yeah. but uh, yeah. sex, didn't accept that and he wanted to find a way to 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 awaken them and bring them back to life so i want to say the full name of your husband the librettist you say it arye lev stolman i just love that a man who writes librettos could be named pretty close to aria <laughs> it means lion a-r-y-e-h yes i know <laughs> um Maybe he should change for his libretto name. He should have a pen name of Aria. Aria. Well, I, I, I'm going to, as soon as I can watch this opera, and I'm just, I'll have boxes of tissues nearby because the story I know, and I'm deeply moved by it. And I know the music will even move me more because you said to me a while ago that the two operas of yours I haven't seen are your two best. Your most recent opera um, recently premiered. And among the things that's different about it is it premiered not in the United States, but in Europe, in Switzerland. Um, again, it's an opera whose story I know from cinema, but I'm not going to talk about the movie. Uh, talk about Lily Elba. Lily Elba was a, was a Danish uh, artist who, a painter who lived at came into prominence in, in Denmark as a landscape artist in the early 20th century and was married to another painter named Gerda Wegner. Lily Elba's name before transit, she was, she transitioned from, uh, she was, she was uh, historically known as Einar Wegner because she, she had been born, uh, Einar Wegner, but uh, she transitioned um, in the first 25 years, 30 years of the 20th century uh, to Lily Elba. She mm -hmm. was one of the first people in history to actually become, become known as, as, uh, as having So much gender fluid as it is to be trans transgender, and um, to have perhaps one of the very first we don't know about. I I don't know about others, if not the first to have uh, gender affirmation surgery in mm -hmm. 1930 in Germany. Um, so she had no no models or examples or no there was no language for what what she was experiencing but she was um felt that she had she was all what she'd always been lily elba and that uh, once she realized that she was lily elba she uh, and she 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 simply not so simply, but realize that 
that Einar Wegner was no longer existed. Mm -hmm. Was, was a, a no longer of the living, as as she says in the opera. Um, so she uh, she she had several surgeries, and the final surgery um, killed her. And yeah. her wife became she became her wife had become her wife's model. Her wife mainly did portraits, and when when she became Gerda Wegner's model, Gerda Wegner started to know six, real success. So it was a really interesting relationship. Um, but they, uh, Lily, but Lily's, her idea, her idea of what a woman, what it meant to be a woman was that you all, well, you have, you don't, you, you wouldn't be a painter, you can be an artist and you would, you would marry a man. You would have to marry a man. I know, and then be a mother, become a mother. So that in order to to really to prove that but of course those those are very antiquated ideas today. So um when I I when I had this idea to do this, I I asked Lucia Lucas, who is who is um a trans baritone. Uh, who ha who uh, I knew because I'd cast her to sing Don Giovanni when I was artistic director at the Tulsa Opera, which in which she presented Don Giovanni both masculine and feminine in the, in in that production, uh, and I asked her if she wanted to 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 do this role and have an opera written for her, and she said yes. That's that's my story, but mm -hmm. uh, but she's still. She's still married to her brilliant uh, contralto that she'd married 10 years before transition named Ariana uh, Lucas. And they've, they've been married for 20 years now. Hmm. So um, I, I was a friend of a woman who was a very famous author, Jan Morris, who had been James Morris and was is one of my very favorite writers. First as James and then as Jan. And what James and Jan had in common, they were about the most famous travel writer of their era. And my interest in Italy brought me to James Morris when he wrote about Venice brilliantly in the 1950s. He had been the person who climbed Mount Everest with Sir Edmund Hillary and documented for the world the exploits of Hillary, Edmund Hillary. That was the same time that Queen Elizabeth I became queen, and therefore it was not the leading story. But I was very drawn to Jan Morris's, James Morris's writings, and I'll make a really long story short. Uh, she transitioned in 1971 and became a middle-aged, a tall middle-aged woman with a square jaw, as opposed to being a rather ruddy British Welsh looking handsome young guy and uniquely wrote about the places that she was famous for knowing Sydney, Andalusia, New York City, Wales, Oxford, Vienna, a few other places, the Roman Empire. First, as James and as being treated as a man in these places, and then as Jan and being treated as a woman in these places. So it was not just travel writing about the places, but about how she experienced them differently after she became Jan to the world rather than James, who she was. And and Jan remained married to Elizabeth, who was J James's wife and had their children and so forth. Um, her writing is exquisite. Her reluctance to underline everything, but just to allow the story to come forth whatever the story is, um, whether she's writing about a hammam in Morocco where she speaks to women or whether she's writing about using binoculars in Central Park to look at the zoo and how she would focus on one thing and then take in the whole world by turning the binoculars. Magnificent writer. And I I knew her only as Jan and, and we became friends and 
we did a lecture together in Oxford in 2014, I think, and profoundly influenced my thought on so many things that I had not, I knew of, but had not been personally exposed to. And my experience of knowing a person who was, to use the more modern terms, trans, um, profoundly not affected my compassion for them as people. I had that before, but in understanding their creativity. And that's that was those were the windows that opened for me. And because Lily Elba previously had been a, let's say, male, a painter, an artist, and so on, um, part of what interests me in this story was where the creativity would go when a person transitions. Did this come up at all in your study of the character and the preparation of the opera? And your husband's writing the libretto? You mean where? Well, I no, I can tell you where, where Lily Elba went artistically from the point of, the point of view of historical fact. Um, she mm -hmm. stopped painting. She said, uh, Einar Wegener painted. Lily Elba is not a painter, but we, we came to the conclusion with Lucia who was our dramaturg, that had she been alive today, there'd have been no reason for her to give up painting. painting. Yeah. Um, have been, I mean, she might have wanted to, that be a right. choice, as, as it was, but um, uh, that we did, we didn't, ex we didn't explore it's not an exploration of her artistic creativity. It is about, it is among many other things about artists and art, but um, it's really, it was really her wife's art that changed as a result mm -hmm. of, of her in effect losing her husband and, um, but gaining, the best model that she had ever yeah. had. Uh, those paintings became famous of many of the ones she did of Lily. So, um, but you know, she never she would have in the, in in the opera she wanted to. She would have rather married, stayed married to Lily, than than have the marriage and all. Yeah. Um. The opera premiered in Switzerland only last October 22nd of 2023. I know it's a common perception to refer to Switzerland as conservative. Um, in my experience, Switzerland is a bit of everything. And it is the nation because of its avowed neutrality that would welcome Tristan Zara and James Joyce and Richard Wagner, your grandpa's favorite guy. Um, and other people who were not necessarily welcome or able to be else, Lenin, um, Dada, I'm forgetting his name now, with the Dadaist movement, um, all of these people gathered in Switzerland. Switzerland has been a refuge for people who could not, you know, I know Italy very well. Many people, I have friends, their grandparents were escapees from fascism who went to live in Switzerland until fascism fell in Italy. And um, so there is that and, and the, you know, people with their cows and their cowbells and everything and their skis, nonetheless, have also welcomed all of these people with their different ideas into Switzerland. Uh, it's a country that has one of the most tolerant attitudes toward uh, people making their own choices for end of life issues. So I don't immediately dismiss Switzerland as being structurally conservative, though it certainly can be. Um, how did it feel premiering an opera with this subject matter in St. Gallen, Switzerland? Well, I, I had been told that St. Gallen, which is the easternmost city in Switzerland, ne next to Austria and with Germany above it, uh, was the most, is the most conservative city in Switzerland. Oh, so, <laughs> so I wouldn't know what to expect, but 
the opera was so, just com so embraced by the the community, by the city, by the press, the local press, but also the national press and the German, German press. Um, it, uh, and people, it, it was it was very popular in St. Gallen. There were many sold out houses. Uh, and I think that, I think people were very proud to have it there because it broke completely new ground mm -hmm. and uh, in several ways. But um, the reception, we didn't know what would happen. Uh, and the reception of for it was a um, it was a, it was a, just enor enormously well received. It was an enormous success. It even won a, there's a, a prize given uh, annually now. It's a fairly recent prize by Oper Magazine by the German critics, and uh, it won best new production of new opera of uh, 2023. And so there was a big award ceremony in Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago. And Yes, I know. I read about that. Yeah. Um, so it, it felt great. And it felt also the culture, the culture the, the, the importance of the of the arts to the people in St. Gallen, which I, I think is probably similar to other other European cities, is something that um is just palpable. There was a there was a snowstorm just before the final performance, which we went back to see, and I thought, oh God, you know, people aren't going to come. And, but you know, first of all, they're Swiss, so they're used to snow, yeah. but. <laughs> Clearly, it's it's a very very much the theater is very much a part of of everyday life, and it's a necessity. So the mm -hmm. government pay it's considered a necessity, um, and being part of being part of that, just getting to be part of that kind of milieu, even for uh, for these past few years when we've worked on it and be and spending a lot of time there was just uh, a privilege because we don't have that in America. No. I love um, America. Don't have the, I love the, America too, but we have things we can do better. Um, you mentioned to me earlier that this opera is viewable online, Lily Elba. Tell us where again so that my audience can view it. Streaming on Opera Vision, which is, which is a channel run by Opera Europa, which is the European uh, equivalent, well, not equivalent, but similar to Opera America here. And it uh, is funded by the European Union. And it's available to stream until June 8th, June 8th, June 8th, June 8th, June 8th of 2024. Well, after I watch Awakenings on your YouTube channel, then I will watch Lily Elba. And I suppose my final question for you is, are you reading any good books lately? Um, well, yes, I am. But the next opera is a, it's an original story. Okay. But I, it's not based on a book. Actually, Lily Elba, source material is, are, is really her... Um, Kind of her diaries, uh, as as were compiled after her death, but uh, the the next one will be is is uh, it, and, and Lily Elba was also we had to invent a lot of, because not not a lot not everything is known about her life, and she yeah. You know, there might be a sentence that says that says something and nothing else about it. So Arye Arye's creativity was really spurred by this, and he he can't he and he was he invented an original story based on she's she's really a, almost become a mythic figure, I think now. So 
there's a lot of reference to myth in it. And so uh, no, next next time will be another original story. One of the banes of my existence as a composer is mm -hmm. getting right underlying properties. And that's something I don't I really just don't want to do anymore. Yeah. Tobias Picker, this has really been wonderful. I I love sitting down with composers because I learned so much and I hope my audience did as well. Um, I feel privileged to have seen five of your seven works and that you whetted more than whetted my appetite to see the other two and anything that you're working on now. And uh, I hope we can join up in life in New York City. Um, I want listeners to know that there must be a brilliant sunshine today because both you and I, I see more backlit, you're lit more as Vermeer would have lit you from the side. But um, I wish you a lot more sunshine. I wish you very good things because you, you've you given so much to opera and I'm very grateful that I get to know you a bit in this in this way. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And and thank you for knowing five of my operas. I didn't know, I didn't know that you would. Thank you. <laughs>